This is the 19th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, X Zone Lures, Shoreline Boat and RV Repair, Spro, Gamakatsu, Big Bite Baits, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk bass fishing. Boy, we have a lot to talk about. Last week was probably one of the uh, one of the craziest weeks that I've ever kind of seen, uh, kind of in regards to what's going on in the industry. Believe it or not, uh, all this revolves around uh, bass fishing, and we did have some bass fishing uh, that went down last week. The National Professional Fishing League wrapped up their regular season. Uh, they just keep taking hits and keep coming back and keep putting out good stuff. Uh, Lake Lanier, the big spots came to play. I think there were, well, I know there were several, so I think there was a 612 spotted bass weighed in. It's a hell of a spotted bass, folks. But Todd Goad uh, averaged, I think, a top 10 finish to win the Angler of the Year. And then Patrick Walters in a 73 boat field uh, wins his third NPFL trophy, which I don't know where he's going to put those things because if you see them like in person, they're like, they look like a barn door, so he's going to be running out of room to put that, especially with what he's done over on the Elite Series. Uh, also wins by about five pounds, and then their championship is going to be next March at Lake Amistad. If I get that incorrect, I think that's right. And then also going on currently practice for the Toyota Championship uh, on Table Rock Lake. And this is this is one of the reasons why I like that uh, that championship the toyota championship you've got just the top caliber anglers the top caliber local and regional guys sprinkle in some guys uh who are household names put them all in a championship and then put it typically somewhere in the midwest at just a real dicey time of the year and that's what we have going on at table rock this week we've got rain clouds snow wind all sorts of stuff going on at table rock temperatures in the 20s in the morning 30s and 40s in the afternoon but someone will win that but i know there's a lot of you guys on here and i've already seen the comment the uh the topic at hand and we'll get right to it with the guests you know there's a lot of been going on between uh what uh mlf announced with their press conference and then you had the anglers protection committee that came out with their press release we've had uh, a number of anglers on different live streams david dudley jumped on bass U. uh obviously ike live uh, was that la either last night or the night before? I'm trying to get that picture of Brian the Carpenter dressed as Becky Iaconelli out of my head. But Boyd Duckett and Stephen Browning went on that. Uh, we had Jordan Lee on last week on BTL. And then, of course, uh, James Watson on Luke Duncan. So I figured uh, if we're going to talk about this, we might as well go right to the top. And I don't think there's any debate. That would be the uh, the number one angler in the world and the face of MLF. And that is none other than Jacob Wheeler who is fresh off of a month-long international journey to Portugal. Jacob, thank you for jumping on BTL this morning. Absolutely, Matt. It's always a good time to talk with you, man. That's a fair That's a fair assessment. You are the face of MLF right now. I mean, you are the number one angler. You're the top dog. You win the most. Your average says the most. And uh, uh, when everyone talks about it, all I hear is, well, none of this stuff affects Jacob Wheeler, so why should he care? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know if I'm the, I'm the face, but I... Um... You know, I've had a had a pretty awesome awesome run the last few years, so I've uh, been fortunate to, to have some some good, some good tournaments. All right, a lot of this went down and kind of broke while you were over in Portugal, and we're going to get into that in the second half of the show. A come from behind victory for the USA Bass Team to win the Golden Chalice. Or is there a name for that trophy? I don't even know, to be honest. No, I don't. I kind of like Chalice. It's an awesome event. I'm excited to talk a little bit more about it too later on in the show. But yeah, it's um, it, it's just cool to to be able to fish in a different country and compete, compete so, in Europe. Yeah, we'll get into that because those bass looked like northern strains to me. That's what I thought too, and they said they were Florida's. I thought that's what I was trying to understand that too. They look like northerns to me as well. They were so fat. I mean, it was it, and they and listen, they are not dumb. <laughs> they are very smart. They definitely know what's going on. 
so a lot of this uh, MLF Bass Pro Tour, a lot of these changes, the the rumors or the rumblings kind of started uh, two and a half, three weeks ago. Uh, the angler only meeting was was bumped up an extra day that's when the rumor mill really started uh the changes came down if you don't know the changes by now uh there's a bunch of them at going back to every fish counts uh some changes in the the payout the format and then in 2025 cutting to 50 and that uh that's kind of when all hell broke loose i think is a fair assessment of yeah. that with with the anglers uh just kind of what has your take been over the last two weeks in professional bass fishing? Um, it's been a lot, you know, it's a lot of changes, a lot of things going, um, different directions. It's, it's, um, a lot of anglers trying to figure out, you know, if that's right for them, there's a lot of anglers careers at stake. Um, it's tough, man. I, I, I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you. There's a lot of, there's a lot of movement, a lot of changes in our sport. I think there's been a lot of changes in our sport over the last five to 10 years. I think there's times that we look at things that, um, bass fishing as a whole right now and tournament bass fishing as a whole is just a different sport than what it has been in, in, in 20 years ago where those anglers, you know, when I started fishing professionally, even in FLW, you could you didn't really social media was just starting at that point in time so the whole name of the game was you're going out there and you're you're you know getting into this professional sport trying to get after them and, and, and build your brand within that organization um and now there's a lot more moving parts to the to the this game than there ever has been um there's obviously social media is huge and and, and to be honest with you if you have a brand like a, a ben milliken or um, you know, some of the guys, have, you know, even Scott Martin, just putting a lot of time and effort into his YouTube, you own a lot of value. And so that changes it all. But, you know, as far as the changes goes, I mean, you, you got to sort of pick one at, at a time to talk about, to sort of really go on, go in on it. I just, there's a lot to it all, you know, and it's, um, it's not easy. There's a lot of people that will be, that will, um, be affected by it. So it's, it's hard as an angler to look at that because, you obviously have empathy and you, you realize, Hey, look, you know, a lot of these anglers put their time in and have been doing this for a long time. So yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult. Let's dive in with probably the biggest bombshell, which was cutting from 80 to 50 in uh, 2025. Now I will preface this with saying uh, bass and the elite series is stuck basically between 107 and a hundred during the split year, I believe there was a 75 boat tournament, but, but even over at Bass, there has been serious talks since I've been a part of it over the past 15, 10, 15 years of reducing that field as well. But because of angler input and an outcry of anglers, it's kind of stayed around that 100 number, uh, with what the MLF proposal is in 2025 talk, Talk about from your standpoint, someone who is not affected by the cut, you have the highest average, you have a lot to gain from this, uh, kind of what that's like going through that process. And then are you interacting with other anglers in the top more? Are you interacting with guys? I mean, do you have guys who are in the, are going to be in the bottom 30 that are calling you? I mean, that's an interesting position to be in because you stand to quite honestly benefit the most from this change. Yeah, I mean, for me, the 50, obviously, that's the biggest thing. I mean, that's a lot of anglers are just looking at this like, what, wow, what, what, what's going on? Um, I, I don't know exactly, like, obviously, I don't know everything there is, uh, you know, about the, running the aspect of, the, of their business and what's going on. But I think they're trying, in their mindset, is trying to, to, to give a, a platform to build um, a, a better product. Um, so jumping on the 50, the one thing that I will say about, a smaller field. I think, I think everybody that's, that's, that's watched MLF um, over the years, um, everybody who's competing at MLF at the BPT, if they're honest with themselves, the one thing that I will say is I'm for getting it to where we can compete all four days um, consecutively. There's no group A, group B, there's 80 anglers on the water or 60 anglers or 50 anglers on the water to where it's just a too confusing. There's group A, group B, this guy gets a flat calm day. This guy has, you know, winds blowing. You learn a little bit of something here. He just, it gets a little wonky. So the one thing I, I, I am for, and I think that needs to happen for this organization is, is going to four days to where the viewer understands, Hey, there's two days, there's a cut. And then you have those anglers that move on from that cut, not who's fishing today, what's going on. That's always been a confusing part of it. And it's been a negative part of, of the product that they've put on. 
I've always thought that, you know, there was never a solution to it, but because at the end of the day, we have boat officials and, and they have to, we have a score, score tracker and we need those boat officials getting the, the numbers, the boat officials we need. Um, so that's, that's a positive at going to a lesser field at that. And, and that's something I do believe that needs to happen as far as what, whether that's, whether we can figure that out at 80, whether we can figure that out at 70, 70, whether it's 60 to me, I think that overall that's important. Um, as far as I have talked, so I am on the board um, with, with the MLFAA and, and the anglers there. Um, I've had several anglers call me. I've talked to several guys from, from uh, you know, the top anglers to anglers that are right on the cut um, or that are, you know, at the bottom of the barrel. And um, obviously there's, there's mixed emotions, but I think everybody sort of is, you know, it's tournament anglers, man. We're just, we're trying to, to live out our dream. This is a dream to a lot of us. Um, I think we look at this as, you know, it's, it's a tough situation. It really is. And just figuring out what's, what's realistic, what's, what's, what's the best going to come out of this? What's the worst, you know, what's the negatives, what's the positives and, and sort of walking through some of those things is, is, is important. I don't know if 50 necessarily benefits me. I don't, cause, cause in my mindset is like, does 50 really benefit me? Maybe the 50 in my mind, it really only benefits the middle guy. Okay. The middle guy, um, in the sport, I think that that's one thing that we've always sort of messed up in tournament bass fishing is we always worry about the guys at the bottom and we always worry about the guys at the top. The guys at the top are going to always make the money. There is whoever it is, it's how it is. I think that the middle class of, of professional bass angling is, is always, it has been, you know, it, it, they haven't been taken care of you know, from everybody getting paid where the guys who are not performing, there's not as much money. It just makes no sense even at 80 that, you know, 40th place is 10 grand and 11th is 10 grand, you know? So I think that's one thing that maybe 50 could benefit, probably a positive there maybe, but um, there's a lot to it all for sure. What role did the MLF AA and the BPT anglers have in this decision? Uh, if at all to go from 50 to 80, you mentioned you're on it. I don't know how much you can talk about that, but the, the general consensus based on the interviews had done before was, Hey, this was kind of sprung on us without angler input. And the whole premise of the BPT forming in 2019 from the bathroom to the boardroom as Duckett said in that quote was angler involvement. And I think a lot of that kind of vitriol was, Hey, there wasn't as much angler involvement in this decision as we would have liked. Yeah, there wasn't any, there was not any, this was, this was strictly business. This was strictly upper management. They decided that this is the direction they're going with the company. Um, and, and, you know, so that, that was not what it was. I mean, there's, I, I, I obviously understand that businesses have to make money. You know, you have to make money. And, and, and so this decision was not angler based. It was not. And um, they decided that 50 was the best plan for them. That's where the, what they thought was the best. It's what they could do. They could, you know, their whole spiel is obviously they can elevate 80 anglers or 50 anglers better than they can do 80. Um, there is less cameras. So mm -hmm. I understand that aspect of, hey, you now you go from 10 cameras uh, on the water to eight. So your percentages go down. So you're covering a smaller field. So your percentages are the same. Um, so there are some cuts that, you know, they're trying to figure that out. But that's that was basically all on all on MLF and their upper management deciding this. Was that surprising to you at all? I think it's, you know, I mean, I, at the end of the day, a business owner has to run the business how they see fit. Like e each of us are individual business owners. Mm -hmm our own brains we all do things completely differently some you know and so i i think there's a certain point in time that you allow things to be an employee run league per per and at a certain point if it's not going the direction that the business owner thinks it should they're gonna they're gonna come in and they're gonna make a decision i i, I personally think that's where they're at okay. i think they're like look we got to get this to where this makes sense for us and what we got going on I commend them for giving it an opportunity. I think there's a lot of just angler decisions that um, they've given those opportunities. And, and, and I, it's better than not having it at all ever. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of my mindset of where they're at. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that that's just business in general. Okay. Uh, and then while we're talking about different organizations, then the APC pops up with an anonymous press release led by, 
who knows over obviously BPT anglers, the anglers protection committee saying there's a group of anglers that are banding together, that they're going to work with uh, MLF on this proposed 2024, 2025. Now this is where things get murky for me because I've talked to some anglers who had, I mean, as of last week, hadn't even heard of the APC and was like, can you send me that press release? Like I fish in this thing and I haven't gotten a call. I've got, I've talked to others from the top to the bottom who are involved with it. Uh, What are your thoughts on where this APC goes? I mean, is there a chance that it'll be heard? Duckett has said in a Bass Fan article that he doesn't recognize it, that he only works through the MLFAA. Uh, Just as an angler, as the top angler, which is why I'm asking you these questions, because whether you like it or not, I mean, you've put yourself in a position to be very well recognized and respected as a top angler in the world. What are your thoughts on the APC and and where the heck that goes? Because I really can't put my finger on it. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough deal because I, I had not even, other than the Bass fan article that I read while I was in Portugal, then it came out, I had not heard anything about APC. Um, I don't, I didn't know anything about it until literally I had, a, they had a call last night with the um, Anglers Association. The APC had had a conversation last night. Okay, so, was, so there is a little bit of, of, there of is now communication. Dots, but I, I, I thought it's, I thought it would have been a little bit faster working if they were going to try to figure something out a solution what can we do what makes sense um and i you know i mean it's just it just seemed like the communication the lack of communication to all the anglers was um nobody knew what was going on and and so for them i think it, it negatively impacted in some ways because i think there was anglers that thought that someone was taking looking out for them and their best interest. And then nobody knows what's going on where if Mm -hmm. you didn't have that APC going on, there would have been someone else jumping in and saying, Hey, what can we do? What does this look like? Communicating to the anglers, figuring out what's going on. I think they're on the right track now, but we've lost a lot of days, you know, in that time frame that sort of no one knew what was happening. Basically, it almost sounds like what they want to do is describe like an angler strike, like a bunch of the guys say, Hey, we're not, we're not going to show so up. We're not going to sign this if it comes down to it. But what you said before and, and basically what Boyd has said uh, on Ike Live and through his comments with Bassman was this was a business decision that was taken out of the angler's hands. And it's it's almost just like, hey, this is what we feel like we have to do to succeed. We're taking emotions. We're taking anglers. We're taking feelings out of it. And yeah, it sucks for you guys, but build a bridge and get over it. Yeah, I mean, it it seems that's the direction they've decided to go. And like, it's, I'm not saying I agree with that at all. I'm just saying that it's, um, it's tough, man. It is. There's a lot of, there's a lot of mixed emotions on, on you know, obviously there's anglers that are inside. They're mm-hmm. like, man, it's just, you know, it's okay. Obviously the majority of anglers, I don't feel like anybody's like saying, Hey, like, rah, rah, this is the you know, perfect scenario because we all understand that that's a big mass exodus of anglers that, potentially aren't fishing at the top level, you know, and, and that's, that's really tough, but I, um, yeah, it's not easy. So if you were to just have just a line of communication from any angler to the top of the BPT, which would be Boyd, I guess, because he is the, he, he's the president. He basically runs everything up there with his titles and he fishes. It would be through that MLFAA and each angler has an MLFAA representative then. So like if I'm angler X and I'm, disgruntled with what went on i'm going to contact my representative from the mlfaa who is then going to hear it formally do a written deal then bring it to the ml mlfaa board which uh, boyd and the bpt committee recognizes and then he hears that disgruntled angler through that it's not 80 guys texting boyd or you or any of the other top guys going what the hell it seems like there's a weird, you know what I mean? Like that, like the, yeah, the, I mean, there's a lot, like that's what Watson said. It's just that the communication lines seem kind of muddled. It, it is weird. I think everybody still goes to to the top. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they're either calling Kathy Fenner a void if they have a complaint. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. know, that's just where it's at. I mean, it's not like we're, um, I think the goal of it, if you have like a rules change or you have an idea of like you have, you want something changed within the rules or something like that. Boyd's not or Kathy's not feeling those calls all day. 
So then that's like when I would jump in with the group of the anglers that I talk with and the group of anglers that I am supposed to keep in contact with, if they have something that are like, Hey, look, Jacob, I think this needs to happen. I, whether I agree with that or not, I bring that to the board a, a, in a board meeting. And then we have a conversation on that. This is a little bit bigger of an ordeal. This is obviously a lot more than the board anglers can handle. You know, it's not like we understand more than what's really out there. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different of an ideal, like when, yeah, I mean, I think it's more day-to-day stuff that the MLFAA and, and those, the angler board is supposed to deal with in this scenario. It's, I think a lot of it's being driven to questions, whether it's through Kathy or through Boyd. All right. Uh, let's get to some more of the nuts and bolts on this. And, uh, like I said, thank you for jumping on BTL and taking these questions. Uh, it's not nearly as fun as, you know talking about hair jigs and I, I, I but it's it's part of the business it's part of the industry that's going on now uh going back to the every fish counts after a single year also from my understanding that was also an executive decision not voted on by the anglers but going to the five bass limit was voted on by the anglers a year and a half ago when they decided to do that during the 2023 season yeah i i voted for five and I, I, um, I voted for five fish because I felt like it was an opportunity to get back to the roots. I think that um, uh, roots are just tournament bass fishing. I mean, that's what I grew up doing. I think it's all of us have. And mm-hmm. I, my biggest my biggest point on that was, hey, look, until anglers can compete in the every fish counts format, I'm going to be for five because I feel like that that's an opportunity. Uh, I think that's just what us anglers, can, you know, we, we relate to for the most part. Now, we'll say this year. I've probably had maybe a hundred individual people that come up to me personally and said, look, man, I really enjoy the four out of five, but it's just not as entertaining as it once was. The, the cut lines definitely were, were not as entertaining, but, but the overall um, view of, of the sport and going to five and there, there was, there was something there. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not the whole, I, for me, like, let's figure like, if anything this year showed, let's put it this way. It does not matter if it's five fish or if as every fish counts, the anglers that are going to be towards the top are going to be towards the top. Mm-hmm. Just sort of how it is. You know, if you look at the guys that are competing, you look at Ott Defoe, I mean, obviously battling out myself still up there in the angler of the year race, you know, it, it's just fishing is fishing. And if you're fishing well and understand what's going on, not saying that the tournament wins, I think there's some, was some more guys that won some tournaments this year that maybe haven't won in every fish counts. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, it just seems like guys who are catching them are catching them, and guys who are, ha- are struggling, you know, are, are struggling to put it together. And so that's the one. If one thing comes out of positive, I every fish counts to me, and five fish to me. Like again, like I don't care for it, it doesn't matter to me on that standpoint. Like I think there's value in every fish counts, but I would much I would really like to see that opportunity for anglers to actually be able to relate to that format. Um, in a way, you know, and if that's coming down the line, then that would be, that would make sense. But that's my biggest, that's my biggest complaint on that side. The thing I've never understood is that the main uh, argument for every fish counts is how quickly you can climb the leaderboard, which is true. We've seen that in the past. We've seen guys go two pound, two pound, three pound, two pound, but in that same token in the every fish counts, you know, you're also, you can jump, 30 spots with one cast as well. If you have a two pounder in your box, then you catch a, a five pounder. Like I thought, uh, especially uh, watching the last one, was it on uh, Saginaw? You know, you're sitting there and like Kevin needs a five, two or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just as uh, I just, I, for me, it was tough to buy the, Hey, people were turning this thing off because it was five fish and not every fish counts as an angler. Do you feel well, I mean, you're always in the top 10, so it doesn't matter. Let's say you're in second. You're trying to catch down first. Do you feel like you have just as big an opportunity to make that comeback with five fish as you do with the every fish counts? Or do you feel like more alive, so to speak, in the tournament with the every fish counts as opposed to five? Um, I, I think every, every fish counts really allows for you to get your instinctual decision making going on because you're, you're th- this is my thing. OK, like. You know, one thing that I do understand where the production aspect of things. Okay, imagine a guy in 20th place um, or your top 40 Mm -hmm. and you have a guy in or 20th place in the group A, group B thing. Um, And guys in 25th, you know, you're you're four pounds, you're within three pounds of the cut line and anybody catches a big fish at 29th and jumps in. They can't capture that moment. Right. 
because they they can't they don't have enough cameras to capture that mm-hmm. moment. When you have anglers moving up and you can see a guy's three pounder, two and a half, two pounder, on not that. on something. Hey, Randy's like, hey, go get a camera in that guy's boat. We're gonna watch this unfold. They have more reaction time to make those decisions to get the camera in the boat for the viewer to ultimately see that that actually transpire. So I see the value in that. I will say minutes watched, the time that I got to watch it, it's not as entertaining as far as cut lines go because there's not as much movement. People don't care about a three pounder when you're like, you know, it's it, it sh- or St. Clair, you know, if I catch a three, if I see a three pounder jump, it's, I'm just like, dang it. You know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not excited about it. I'm like, that's not going to help at all. I get in, I release, I'm gone. I'm not even thinking, it's not even in my mind. We're in a, you know, a three pounder. If I hook a three pounder and it jumps, I'm like, dude, don't come off, you know, in another scenario and every fish counts moment. So there's an, it's more exciting. I, I do think in scenarios, I mean, for me, it's more exciting to compete in that level because I feel like I can control, Hey, I can get 10 bites today or I can get 15 bites today where if I'm down by five pounds and an anger caught an eight pounder, I, I have to catch, I have to catch a, you know, a, I might have to catch an eight pounder or six pounder, or eight, pound, seven pounder to, to call the win. I can, then I'm sitting here and I'm like, the, all I can really do is pick up a, yeah, a, a big point. wide bait or something like that to try to generate that bite. And most of the time your odds of that happening are slim to none where if I'm down by seven pounds and I have, you know, all I know, Hey, I'm on as a buzz bait bite and I can run the bank and I can cover water and I catch three, three pounders and win this tournament you know, I have more control of my destiny in that way. That's a good point. I see that. I, I, that's a great way to explain it. Uh, the The next thing that I want to get your take on is uh, reduced camera days on the BPT next year, but they're picking that up on the team series. I thought that was an interesting take because the team series, uh, the cups, the for a while, the world championships were always filmed. Uh, recorded and then put out on TV. Yeah. I think it's no secret that starting in 2011, when they did the uh, MLF Cups before the BPT even formatted, that was their cash cow. The money has always been made on the TV shows. Uh, I think it's a very interesting move to take emphasis off of BPT days and put it on Team Series days. In, in your opinion, is that do you think the team series is going to take off? Why the focus on the team series now and the live extra 25 live days on team series and taking it away from the BPT? Um, so so to me, I think that's a good move. And the reason why I think that I think the product, like sort of like I've already stated, <clears throat> the overall product of the BPT was way too long. It was way too okay. drawn out. Everybody sort of knows what's going on, unless we were changing bodies of water. And giving the viewer a different look of what was trans something completely different, which we've done and we did this year, you know, going from Douglas to Cherokee, it was the same old for six days. Six days on the water, it's a lot. I mean, a viewer doesn't want, I mean, a lot of times. So I so I think you keep some of that in, and that's good. I think you don't have a storyline necessarily. You let the storyline sort of unfold, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you start on your elimination day. I've actually been all for that because to me, that allows for me to go and do something that I want to go do, figure it out. And then I can sort of keep some stuff back in, in my pocket. And then I don't have to expose it all to the world day one of the qualifying round. You know, day one, I'm sitting here like, come on. And I, and I think it also overall will help viewership because, yeah, everybody's going to want to turn on group A, group B elimination, group A elimination round. Um, number one to see who gets eliminated who who moves on but number two see exactly what's transpiring and each group might be completely different in how they're fishing and Mm -hmm. how the top anglers competing how are they not so i i think that's a really good move just to really just because because you you know sometimes we have way too much um too too much going on and, and and too long of a product i feel like to be streaming every single day personally i feel that way that's six straight days yeah, I just to me, I think it's a little bit long. I think that I think the viewers get sort of like, okay, you know, we're sort of been here. Uh, I think I think the 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 guys, the, the employees in, in MLF that are working, they're struggling to find storylines and trying mm-hmm. to do something a little bit different. I think that will help revitalize that. I think it, it keeps more bang for your buck in in a smaller room there. Now, as far as the team series goes, I'm a big fan of that because MLF and the cups 
<clears throat> that's a really cool, unique format. And, and so there's a lot, I, you're gonna have to watch the cussing scenarios because there's a lot of stuff that's said, but on the, on the comms, like yeah. between the guys that were just like, we're going off. Like, Oh yeah. You know yeah. I never thought of that. It, it, it's a lot of fun. It's really a lot of fun. So it'll be, I think that'll be a really, really cool product because you're listening in on these comms of these anglers and how they're dissecting something. And there is no, like there is, we're not hiding anything because we're trying to win. Like I'm trying to tell whoever's on my team, I'm telling, you know, Dylan Hayes, dude, no, they're on the front edge of these mats. And this is the reason why you have to have the wind blowing here. X, Y, Z. So I'm explaining all of this that probably doesn't make it to the TV show that you're going to hear that kind of, that banner Mm -hmm. that there's gonna be a lot we're we're talking nonstop of what we're seeing so there's gonna be a lot to learn in those shows that i think that um in in, on that live side of things and then in addition to that i think that also and and there's a lot of anglers um that have benefited from that i think that you benefit from the those tv shows and those made for tv events and you sort of build your your brand if you will in those events whether you have your sponsors on your jerseys or not there's an opportunity to build your brand there and so every angler i mean from my understanding the majority of the anglers obviously are going to be competing in the team series so every every angler is going to have an opportunity to be on a live camera and and and, and have an opportunity to build their brand and and show who they are on that live whether they had a great year on the bpt or not so i think there's a couple of things i i like those changes a lot personally i do uh, you mentioned the build the brand. I'm trying to pull it up here. So you guys have three man teams and I know the jerseys are all the same colors, but do you guys have the ability to put your own sponsors on the jerseys or is that? No. Uh, okay. So, so that goes back to one of the sticking points that a lot of professional anglers have back to the old FLW days and elite series or mainly FLW days. When you would make the final day, you would get the pedigree jersey and then your sponsors that sponsor you all year go well what the heck you're on tv but i don't get to see any of this stuff but you're focused more on building personalities through the team series by the anglers being able to see the process than you are the logo on the jersey is what you're more more focused yeah i mean our, to be honest with you the fall is not the time for for live streaming numbers your numbers aren't going to be as good as the spring so you're not like you know now I will say this, like if a sponsor is a sponsor of the league, so like a Rappler, for instance, Rappler will be on my Jersey or, um, you know, if icon was a sponsor of the league, icon would be on my Jersey. So there's going to be, there's, there's definitely sponsors that I'm Some crossover. Yeah. There was crossover there. So, um, but on the other side, yeah, I'm not as worried about that part of it as much as I think it's more of an opportunity for an angler to build their brand. Cause I, you know, I, like we, like we sort of talked about, on the front end of this is like, I think bass fishing has changed and it has, we all sit here and we look at this and, and, and there are several people that have sort of brought this up, but I, I've thought, I've thought this forever um, for the last five years, really um, a big deal is, it's just, if you don't, you have to build your own brand. Social media is your biggest platform, not, not bass master, not MLF. Your biggest platform as a professional angler is your own social and how hard you want to work is up to you. Do you want to work hard? Do you, it's all depend. You want to just fish? You can do that. Um, and there's anglers that have worked hard to try to sort of build their brands, mm-hmm. if you will, on social, whether that's YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Um, and that takes a lot more effort. That takes a lot of effort off the water that, that you know, and, and they're getting paid because of that. Um, you hear this. This is what, you know, it is crazy, too. You hear like, you know, in the fall, you, you know, you talk to you have your budget meetings and you talk to some some of the the uh, marketing managers, you know, at, 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 at certain companies. And you hear, hey, you know, our budget got cut. I think a lot of money has been in, in, and continue to go this way um, has been cut from professional angling and gone to the influencer aspect of the sport has been a huge thing. It's, um, you know, the budgets are getting bigger for for influencers and and. Mm-hmm and less for tournament anglers and uh, because they're getting a guarantee out of it. If I pay an influencer X amount of money for, Hey, this spot on their YouTube channel, and you're going to, you know, guarantee me 50,000 views. Um, and then they have a clause in there that, Hey, if, if you don't get 50,000 views, you're going to have to shout me out one more other time during uh, another, another video, they're guaranteed something. And so I, I, I really just think that 
we also as anglers, and I'm not even saying in this scenario, but as anglers overall um, in this sport have to look at ourselves right now as well. There's a lot of angle, and I'm not saying in this, you know, in the cuts, I'm just saying overall of like, we have to look at how, what kind of job we are doing for our, ourselves. Are we really, you know, we got to take some ownership, at least 25% ownership of how is your business being run? Are you getting sponsorship? That cannot be a woe is me. This is the league or, well, Bass isn't helping me or MLF isn't doing this. You have the platform. You have the opportunity just like anybody else does. Um, and I've talked to several people. I'm like, you know, even within, you know, companies that I work with. And I'm like, if I'm a company owner right now, I am not investing in any professional angler right now that is not investing in themselves. It's not happening. If you're not investing in your own brand, I'm not going to invest in you. And I would not, I would not suggest someone to invest in, in, in that. And that's, I think so many people are going that way. We have a great opportunity in this sport, but we have to realize it's not just about tying knots and real ambassador anymore. We have to realize we have to teach someone along the way. It, it, and, and that's something that I think that so many people, we, we, it's so easy for human nature to look at other people for wrongdoing. Or, but sometimes it's hard, the hardest thing is self-reflection and looking at yourself and if you made a bet and if you're not doing the best job. And I think that some anglers and a lot of anglers, we have to look at that. And we have to look at ourselves and say, all right, are we doing our job? Are we doing as good a job as we could be doing? Am I giving myself the best opportunity for my business to, to succeed? That's well said. I experienced that a lot with BTL because there's, I add value by fishing the opens, but it is a BTL brand that I'm doing something that's completely off the water that is primarily that I can guarantee a return on that. And shockingly, it's a little bit of work to do a podcast every day. You think you just jump on and, but it's a little bit more work. That's hey, well said. There's, Jacob. A lot, there's a lot, there's a lot of thought that goes into what you uh, do. I, I want you to kind of wrap it up for one more question. We'll take a break. Uh, appreciate uh, you talking about this, but in your opinion, what is the state of MLF? Is it teetering on the edge? Is it strong? Is it reorganizing? If if you were to put your finger on it, I, I, I mean, brutally honest, sometimes I can't tell whether they are on the edge of catastrophe and we're going to see a completely new alignment in the next 24 months or whether it's a rebranding and a rebuilding and they're going to come back stronger than they have before. You're an angler. You're the top guy in it. What are your thoughts on that? And does that concern you at all? How many changes there have been over the past five years and how much controversy has been surrounded by those changes? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it, it's frustrating for me. It is. I mean, there's no doubt that sort of jumping back in the, into upper management from the start of this whole ordeal went about it the completely wrong way. There's no doubt. I, even myself looking at it, being 20 some years old, looking at it and thinking that, Oh, this is, you know, MLS going to come out here and do everything right. Is it just not even, it obviously didn't happen. And, and it took some, some time to realize that there's a lot more to running a professional bass angling tournament than just a TV show. Um, uh, you know, the state right now, I mean, obviously it's, it's in there. They would say it's a reorganization. They're trying to, to give, you know, Boyd would obviously say, Kathy would say they're trying to give the best um, product and platform for their top anglers. That's their, their mindset. Uh, I think that for me, I want something, let's lock in on what it is, let's stop messing around. And if this is the direction of where we're going, then let's ride with it. But I, yeah, I am, I'm definitely um, irritated with all the changes. I'm irritated. I'm frustrated. I think that I think in the front end of this organization, it was mismanaged the first few years. I think they didn't they didn't adjust quick enough. Um, that's that's difficult for me to see because I think that there's a lot of anglers that put themselves in a position. Um, I think that there's there's some good decisions being made. You know and have been made, but obviously there's been a lot of decisions that were really bad. And um, I, I think from the front end of the organization, you know, when you look at it, they, they bought into linear television when linear television was doing this and everything else was, you know, in streaming and everything else was, was, was rising. Um, and, and that was just a bad, you know, investment on that side. I mean, if you look at what MLF and, or the outdoor channel has been at, um, they're 50% less homes than what they were, you know, mm -hmm. when they were when we started. So there's some things that they 
you know, there were some there were some things that happened that that you can't blame the organization for. But I do think in the first few years that I there's some things that I definitely hold them accountable for. And I think that like trying to invest a lot of they were trying to invest a lot of their money into the pro circuit. And then they were, you know, they're not they're not weren't paying attention to the BPT. And then it just it got real wonky. And, and there were some things I'm sure if you give the ma- upper management an opportunity to redo that, I'm sure they would have done it differently. But um, really right now, and I, and I told this to an angler the other day, I said, look, yes, it frustrates me in certain scenarios of how things were managed. There's some decisions that I don't agree with necessarily, but all I can do right now is focus my energy on how to make it better. And it's not worth spending days and countless hours crying over spilt milk. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just how I feel. And so, yeah. I mean, I would also imagine there's got to be a little bit more stress and pressure on the angler owners of MLF too, because it, there are a number of anglers who are part owners of this, who have a lot of money invested in this too. I mean, that's got to be stressful as well. Oh, I mean, I'm sure there is. I don't think that aspect, as far as the owner's aspect, I don't mm-hmm. know if that's, I don't know how much money they have in it, but I don't, I don't think the majority of those anglers are, are worried about their dollar bills. I, I really don't think that. I just don't, I don't feel like those anglers, as far as, as far as owners that were in it, you know, that were owners of, of this whole ordeal, I don't think that's it. I mean, if they invested whatever, $25,000, $50,000, mm-hmm. I think the majority of those anglers are well off. They're not worried about a $25,000. they are not going to negatively, negatively impact the sport of bass fishing for their $25,000 or $50,000 investment. That's dumb. That's fair. I, I just don't see that. I just don't see how those anglers would be worried about that at all. All right. Can we get one more question just out of the way and then we'll move on to Portugal? Mm-hmm. I've seen this pop up over and over again. Well, of course, MLF gives Jacob Wheeler special treatment because he's sponsored by companies that are sponsored by MLF. Your response to that statement? I just, it just mind boggling to me. It's mind boggling to me that, that, that people think that uh, just because you're sponsored by a company that's associated with, with uh, a sponsor of the league, it just, that doesn't happen. It's not realistic. I mean, I just don't see that. It's just not, I mean, you can ask several people uh, that it's just not, it's just not how the industry works. I mean, everybody has to go out there and work. Everybody has to go out there and catch them and everybody has to run their own business. And that's just sort of how it is. It's just not even a, just, it's comical to me. The rumors that are thrown out there um, in this space. And it just, it's, it's, it's a, I just, I just shrug them off and just like, okay, you know, more than I do then. All right, there we go. Jacob Wheeler. I applaud and commend you for that 44 minute segment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to dive into the, is it, was it the eighth annual Black Bass World Championships in Portugal? I've had a couple shows about this. I want to get your take on the realistic chance of bass fishing ever making it to the Olympics. This is one that for some reason it ticks off a lot of people. Like, I can't believe you would ever say that. But I've also talked to some people who are like, no, this is a realistic thing. So we'll talk about that when we come back. Jacob Wheeler on a Monday. Tomorrow's Halloween. Also, don't forget, get your pumpkins into Matt at BassZone.com or tag Frank Scalish and myself on Instagram with your bass fishing BTL day four related pumpkins for a chance to win an entire set of custom color DD 22s or Norman fat boys. Uh, those need to be in tom- by tomorrow, or, but no, they need to be in. I think I said November 1st. Yeah, that's a Wednesday because we're going to look at them and then pick the winner uh, on Thursday, but BTL on a Monday with Jacob Wheeler. We'll be back right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up with the angler design function and performance in mind. Nothing on this new offering was compromised. And the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar. This new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Legendary brand. 
Champion, Top One Strike King. All right, guys, if you're a construction worker, soccer dad, soccer mom, you want to be outdoors, you've seen the Reaper. This right here is the Zip Up Full Reaper, but it's windproof, folks, windproof. And it actually has the mask built in. It's behind me. I mean, if you can look good and feel good and stay warm, you better check it out. It's the Zip Up Reaper. That's right, windproof. Shoreline Boat and RV, dock rash, storm damage, collision repair, that deep scratch or gouge from trying to access that secret creek. Shoreline Boat and RV can get your prize possession back in mint condition and looking good on the water, fast. All repairs are done in-house, so they're able to get your boat or RV back to brand new, quickly. All Shoreline's work comes with a rock-solid warranty. Find out more at ShorelineBoatAndRV.com, Kansas City, Austin, and Tulsa. All right, welcome back, BTL on a Monday, talking with Jacob Wheeler. I think I drastically underestimated the amount of Black Bass World Championships that there have been. It's X V one one. That's ten. That's seventeen, right? X is ten, V is five, and then the two lines is one. So that would have been the seventeenth Black Bass World Championship held October sixteenth through twenty third in Portugal. Yeah, I didn't know how that. I didn't know there was that many either. I'd be honest. I've actually been doing it uh, the last couple of years, so I just sort of um, it's a it's yeah. They, I know there's there's been some push on it. I know that a few anglers from like um, Mark Rose, Scott Martin, a few guys originally started trying to push this thing back in in South Africa. I believe they had a, a, the first one that we were a part of, yep. and that was sort of the start of it for for our side of it anyway. Uh, Scott Canterbury, David Fritz. I'm looking at the picture, so I hope I can get them right. Scott Canterbury, David Fritz, Scott Martin, Freddie Boom Boomer, and Bannis, yourself, Dustin Connell, and Charlie Evans. Uh, no, maybe, maybe a team Charlie organizer, Evans. maybe. Wait, who's this at the end? Hold on. I thought it was a very, probably Mark, well, uh, probably Mark I Schwab. thought it was a very excited Charlie Evans. Who's that right there? That's Mark Schwab. Oh, okay. Does he not? Is that that's forgivable? He kind of looked I, I like Charlie it. Evans. I, I could see it, you know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, talk a little bit about what what was this tournament? I mean, I mean, it, it had what sixteen, seventeen countries in it. I mean, it looked big on social media, but then in the industry, I don't feel like it was publicized or it wasn't looked at as big as it appeared in person. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's um, it's a work in progress for sure. I, you know, I've, I've worked with. Um, worked with the organization a little bit. I've worked with uh, our team USA side of things a little bit. And really, I feel like we're in the, there's, there's some really key moments that are, you know, uh, there it's, it's, it's an event that's awesome to be a part of. I'll tell you what, last year here in the United States, it was on Lake Murray and there was 20 some countries that competed. We had to provide the organizer has to provide the boats for the countries it's a lot of work. There's a lot of people that are donating the, the time. I mean, think about it. It's just a lot of work to make it to, to make it all happen, you know, just run smoothly. And so the biggest thing is, you know, there's no money involved in this. There's no money as far as you're not, we're not, you're just there to to compete for your country and represent the bass fishing world as far as the USA bass fishing world. Uh, and so the cool thing about it is, is like you go out there and you see these anglers from Costa Rica or Germany um, that are coming here to compete. And it, it, it just gives you a, a different perspective on the tournament as a whole, um, as a sport as a whole. It, it makes you feel like there's there's room to grow. And I remember last year I flew out of Italy. I was in Italy for the for July on a, on a summer vacation. And um, I remember I'm like, man, it would be so cool to see tournament bass fishing grow in Europe and other parts of the world. I mean, that's really the biggest thing. If there was one thing in my career long-term or a couple of things, that is definitely up there as far in my mind is seeing the sport grow in other place, places of the world. Um, it would be amazing. But for that to happen, and I've challenged them on this, I said, you're going to have to have anglers like maybe the Johnson brothers representing or a Coop Galan or a, uh, or a Gussie, uh, a somebody um, in the professional bashing world represent Canada. You're going to, you're going to have to with, um, 
you know, with Japan, maybe it's Taku or, or Takahiro Mori, or, you know, there's going to be a few of those guys that you're going to have to bring in and, and have compete for, for their countries um, and their respective uh, countries. So like there, there's some things that need to sort of, for it to get the notoriety that it deserves. And I think it, it should. Um, there's some things that are flawed overall, but, but I think that the overall look of what we're trying to do and what that, what this tournament is trying to do is to bring light on this, on this sport and, and at a world level uh, mm-hmm. is a step in the right direction. So what can we do as fans or what can anglers do to make this thing uh an annual or a semi-annual deal where it is like a Ryder cup feel to it. Cause I mean, yeah, I'm a golf fan, but man, that Ryder cup means so much to, to those anglers on the European side and the American side. It's not just another golf tournament to them as someone in the media to have a international event that draws that so much attention and all that would be awesome to be able to have all that content leading up to it. So what needs to happen in your opinion to take it to that next level? But like I said, I, I truly feel like the, the next next level of this tournament it has to come to from the angler side of it. It has to come from increased your increased um, skill set of, of anglers and brands within this it, with, that are competing in this tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can get to that level, then you have. I mean, obviously, it's not a shoe, and we've we, we've won. We actually tied with Germany this year, and Germany doesn't even have bass in it. <laughs> like they, as a team that we tie, they, they fished phenomenally. They worked well as a team and um, they did a great job and we barely edged them out. So, but it should never be a deal where everybody just looks at it and views it as, okay, well, the United States is going to win. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I think that if it gets more competitive where it's more meaningful and you have some of these high end anglers that, that are here in the States that are professionally fishing. And then of course, some of the anglers that, that are qualifying, you have to give an opportunity for qualifiers and, and some things like that, or other anglers can get in, but um, that's going to help get that notoriety and value of, of this tournament to another level, because it's not going to be like, Oh, well, it's USA, just USA is just beating up on, on the rest of the world scenario. Like, you yeah. know, nations, it's going to be like, Hey, look, you know, Canada won it this year. Japan won it. Well, you know, these guys, it, it just, it's going to be a real, competition with anglers that everybody knows and realizes. And then when, if Germany does win, they're going to be like, dang, Germany. Yeah, it's a massive upset. I mean, you should be talking about how Germany hung with the U S but could, could you not see this thing taken off more? If you at least have lists of, of qualified or points tournaments, just like it is for the, the Ryder cup where you take the top angler. So whether that's the top couple BPT guys in the top elite yeah. series guys, or you have points that you could even throw opens and Toyotas in there that aren't worth as many points as the top, but you get a guy or someone like a Dakota Ebear who has a chance to get in. And then you sanction those tournaments also in South Africa and in and in Canada, you know, where if you have an angler fishing in the States, like a, a Taku or the Johnsons, they still get points, but they're qualified, you know, then they have the Japanese. So you're, you're actually throughout the year, you know, you could go into a tournament going, man, I need a top 10 here to qualify for team USA, or I need a top 30 in this to qualify for team Japan kind of standardize that point system around. So now there's something to look at for every single year, or every other year as it comes down to the wire. Yeah, I would. I, I think that would probably be the way to do it. I mean, I, I don't really know the Ryder Cup, the backside of it. That would be awesome if we could do that. You know, some in some way, shape, or form, that would be the way to do it. Because at the end of the day, when you look, I knew I know that um, several anglers were asked how they were trying to sort of do do this. From my understanding, at least on on the the Team USA bass side, was invite. Um, invite angler of the year um so they invited brandon paul and and he couldn't make it he had elk -hmm. elk hunting trip they invited several angler of the years first off the rip so that's sort of how they did it um the year before i won angler of the year so i got an invite um and then they sort of figured it out from there and went down the list so then of course Mm -hmm. you know because you also have a lot of anglers who turn it down because it's not a big deal to them right now exactly so so to me it I, I saw that vision of like what this that we're trying to do something good for this for the sport and I and, I, and again that's sort of one of my passions is to help grow um, grow the sport if at all possible and so like to me that's really where like my mindset is with this and like I think if you can get it to where like you said if you can have the standardized 
sort of way of doing that with within like the sort of like the Ryder Cup is. But I don't know how you're going to do that for South Africa. I don't know how their tournaments are run yeah. all over the. You know, a lot of them are fishing perch tournaments in Europe. They're fishing walleye tournament, well Xander tournaments. Um, you know, there's only a handful of places, you know, that have bass. So it's just figuring out. I don't know if you could do that everywhere but you can maybe do it for a few countries well the sure. next ones we got 2024 in in uh paris france and then uh 2028 in los angeles the olympics will be in los angeles in 2028 there you go Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I would, I would like to know, like, is this a realistic thing? Will we ever see fishing at the Olympics? Is there, is there too much live animal stuff involved? I mean, but then you look at it, you're like, well, you got them like shooting stuff on ski. Like, there's been rhythmic, yeah. rhythmic, uh, interpretive ice skiing. Have you ever seen those videos? That was it. That was an Olympic sport, ice skiing, yeah. like where they had the music and you got guys twirling around and stuff. Is this a pipe dream? that we talk about occasionally or is there yeah, actually think, a chance? I mean, I think there's a chance an outside chance. I think there's a lot of things that I, that would have to go into this. I think a catchway release format will have to happen long-term. I think you're going to have to have some things and scenarios of, you know, if, if it is going to happen, but if, if, even if it doesn't, it would be cool to see a true world championship within countries that, that is, you know, uh, uh that's recognized by bass recognized by MLF and, and, and a really cool opportunity for, for all of us to go and compete in, in different parts of the world to really, you know, build the sport up. I think so to me, like I, I think yes, long-term would be great to see at the Olympics. I'm not betting on that necessarily right now. I think it would be great to see that. I would, I would love to see that, but I, to me, the realistic goal is to build this tournament up and figure out a game plan of how to have live streaming, mm -hmm. how to have a better understanding and have better, uh, a, a, you know, um, media behind this to really, really show what's going on and some of the storylines that are happening. Um, that, that to me is really my, you know, next couple of years goal. I mean, yeah. later down the road, if we build it up to something even bigger then yes, great. Absolutely. I get that's the end goal. If that's five, 10, 20 years from now, or I'm dead and gone, you know, it, that, that would be awesome. Yeah. I think that it can be done. And I say that because of what Billy Egan and one bass has done to elevate the U S open nationally. Uh, always a very prestigious event on the West coast. Kind of you hear stuff about it East, but what he did when they went with the live streaming, when they brought so many of the anglers from the East coast over, they've, uh, really engaged with the uh, media platforms that are out there, gone and talked about it, created a lot of tournaments around that one bass US Open. And I think, uh, especially over the last eight to 10 years, it's become well more nationally recognized than just that kind of West Coast vibe for the US Open. So I think it can be done. Yeah, it, it has to have the right people in place and the management has to understand where it needs to go. I think. Fitz is the organization that sort of runs this tournament. We run under the, their rules, which is a European run, okay. um, you know, re European run organization and company. Um, so we're, we're sort of, you know, there were some things that we had to push back this year, like media, like having camera guys in your boats and certain things are trying to get the rules sort of set up to where, you know, um, like, like, look, media is not allowed to, to take, cause they're very strict about you couldn't film other countries because you could be gaining advantages. Really? Um, in the film and really so it's like it there it's it's not just show up and have this friendly competition no, with other it, countries like when you're there it's there yeah there's there's a lot of everybody's competing to win and 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 so it's a really interesting there's yellow cards um that are what, what's out. a yellow card so i guess if you get from my understanding if you get two yellow cards you can get dq your team can get dq how do you get a so, yellow card? So if you break a rule, so like a rule would be like, uh, okay, so for instance, in this turn, this is what's crazy, okay? I, we got to talk more on like the overall, but in this tournament, you cannot get within 75 meters of another team. 75 meters, which is like 248 feet, I think, something like that. It's a long way. Do A long way. And if you are going to pass them, and say you're in a creek, that's, that's you know, yeah. smaller than that 
you have to ask them which side they you want to to to, to pass on, and then troll a motor around them, and then get past that. And this is in the rules. Yes. Yes. Another really cool, interesting thing at the, in Portugal, which is obviously would never fly here, but I thought it was crazy. So I was working with, I was talking with the organizers there, um, and they're like, "Yeah, we we pulled a permit for the lake. It was Lake Sabor, which is actually uh, Sabor Dam, Sabor Dam." They call their lakes dams, which they have a dam, of course. Um, so in in that scenario, they pull the permit for the lake where no one else could fish this body of water except for the people that were competing on that body of water for this for I got 10 days. That's a tournament English dream. I know. So I was like, what? Like, I, I, like, so you have a steward in your boat and there were some bank fishermen on the bank. And he's like, hey, I need to call the organizer. Do you mind if I call the organizer? And this is like, what? Is that like a marshal, a steward? Yes. Okay. They, they call him a steward. So it's a marshal. So he's like, do you mind? He asked Dustin and I, because Dustin and I were on team. He said, do you, uh, you mind if I call the organizer? I'm going to call, call, call them up and find out uh, those guys aren't a lot of fish. Yeah. I'm like, what? What? Like, yeah, they aren't, they aren't a lot of fish. So I'm like, no, don't worry about that. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. They're just making yeah. a couple of gas off the bank. Like it's fine. But yeah, so that's, it's, it's, I just, it's a different way of obviously Europe in general was, was, was interesting, but you know, that was, um, that was crazy. Is there actually a yellow card that gets held up? I don't know about that. I don't know about the yellow card. Did aspect. anybody get a yellow card? I'm intrigued by this yellow card. Aspect. No. So there was a couple of things that like anglers got a little close. And so like, the team captain maybe from Italy might say, Hey, um, mm-hmm. or team captain from the U S might go over to Italy and say, look, Hey, you know, you guys got a little close, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to turn you in because you have to like have a protest and put money up for your protest. Okay. So you protest to get someone in a yellow card scenario, you have to put money up and you have to write your protest. So if, that did actually happen, then you get your money back, I guess, or something like that. This or is something, blowing something. my mind. It, it is an interesting, it, there's some things I was like, wow. So um, they actually, all the, all the, the marshals or stewards have um, range finders to make sure that, that you're far enough away. No, they don't. Yeah. So if, so, so if I you- roll up on a bank and, and I'm sitting there and I, and there was a boat already there and I get within that, that boat closer than you let you know, miles, they say, Hey dude, you can't, you can't, you can't, because that person was already there. So I can't fish by that person within 75 meters of them because they were already there. Even if it's day two and you've got a, an offshore brush pile and they didn't catch crap and you're leading the tournament, you can't roll up to them and be like, dude, this is my pile. You could, you could say that you cannot cast, you cannot cast. So I can, I could go up and have a conversation with someone yeah. and say, look, this wasn't right. Or, Hey, X, Y, Z, yeah. and sort of, you know, how I feel about something. Uh, but that, you cannot cast within 75 meters. Listen, out of out of all the things you've said, I think the range finder rule could has potential to a not only make money for an organization by having a title sponsor range finder, but b put put an end to a lot of on the water disputes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it <laughs> I don't know, it might add more because you know you're there and all of a sudden, I mean, can you imagine so what do you do if you're on the bank? Like, let's say you're on a read line and and you're going left and the other guy's going right and you're meeting in the middle. Like, how does that scenario on play? Are so you getting within 75 or is he getting within 75? Well, that's the thing is like, you don't, at that point in time, I don't know if you don't, you, you know, if you're both sort of going down the bank and you don't know who got to where. Yeah, that happens all the time. Control. Yeah, I know. I think the goal is at that point in time, just to sort of, leave the 75 yard 75 meters alone and sort of get past just no casting. And then you wait till they get past you. Then you start fishing again. That's, I mean, I tried to stay as far away from boats as I possibly could in the competition. So it was something that I was like, I'm not trying to. Interesting. Uh, Is, is the USA like, is everyone gunning for the USA? Obviously. Uh, Do you feel the pressure? Do you feel the other countries that are like, you guys are the target? Yeah, I mean, I think you, um, yeah, I mean, you don't want to, yeah, I mean, everybody's sort of gunning to have that opportunity to beat 
you know, the guys that are fishing professionally. Cause you know, at that point, there's not really that opportunity there in Europe and other countries. Yeah. So I feel robbed that I didn't get a chance to watch this live and root for the USA. This needs yeah. to be like Ryder I, cup. I it really does. It, it would, it would be amazing if we could ever get it to that point, because I, I, if they could have it live, I don't know. See next year it's in Italy. So next year's uh big bat, uh, the world championship is in actually in Italy, Italy. Um, so that'll be a cool event, but I think the the I, I would love to see it go li- have a live live yeah. cover. Are other countries is this massive for them, or is it kind of like it is here, where it's a little bit underground and not? I, I mean, are there countries that, that they're fishing the entire year to make this team, and everyone who bass fishes in that country knows who the standings are, who the team is, and follow it religiously right. throughout I, the competition? I think the majority of like you know, obviously it's a, it's a it's a tight knit group of anglers yeah. that are fish you know bass fishermen. I mean. When you think of like the team from Germany and, and the guys over there, you know, having to travel eight hours to get to a to a fishery that they could drop their boat in that has bass in there, you know, that's that's crazy. Um, but it's also, um, it, you know, I think that so it's a lot smaller of a market than you know each country and then than we obviously have in the states. But yeah, I think I think the majority of the guys who enjoy professional bass fishing or enjoy tournament bass fishing, they know what's going on. They know who's who's going to represent, you know, that country if they were on the team or they're not on the team. You know, there's definitely that. Here's why I think it'll work in the Olympics, because this was an Olympic sport. That is interpretive ski dancing. <laughs> I, I mean, was in the Olympics. The the biggest thing you're gonna have problems with is it was is getting in on on you know animals in, in the fish, and that's gonna be like figuring out that line is gonna be a, a, a I think you're gonna see that would be the toughest thing probably. And if we could figure out how to to do a catch rate release format, you could prove that your mortality rates not you know I. But you know what's crazy? Like in Germany, like your their rules in Germany, if you catch a fish, like if you catch a perch, you're supposed to kill it. You're not like catch and release is like catch and release is like against the law. Really? Yeah. So so it was really cool. I, I got the yeah, opportunity. You got a bunch of... Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Sorry. I'm yeah, I got sorry. you. So we have that front coming in. It's it's cold where you're at, but it's not too cold here yet um so i actually the uh uh the angler that provide let let me borrow his boat christian beard he runs an organization there and i did a um did like a more like a podcast like youtube podcast sit down style with him talking about because he runs an organization there as well um he owns like the rights for mlf uh germany he owns the you know he has perch and uh and xander tournaments um you know, so there's some things in that that they're trying on their side. But so that's how I'm, I actually learned a lot of how this is all going on and what his his mindset was mm-hmm. uh, and where he thought this this sport could go in, in Europe. Because obviously, you just you just don't know how big it is all over. All right. Anything else you want to have a burning desire to get in here, Jacob? Before I let you go, like I said I know you've been gone for a month. You've been back a couple of days. Have you done the trick or treating thing already, or has that happened tonight? No, it happens tomorrow. I have, um, I'm, 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 uh, branch. I'm going to be branch from, um, from trolls. My, my little girl, what? princess, princess Poppy. And my wife's going to be princess Poppy. And then, uh, Hudson's going to be, uh, baby. I got, but baby, babies. I don't I got to look at this thing, but yeah, so I have to, um, that's uh, what you're going to be for Halloween. That's who I have to be. That's what my that's my 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 little Olivia wants me to be that guy. Brand. I will say this proudly: Trolls is a very underrated banger. It is Dude, a phenomenal. Now I was not as big of a fan of Trolls too, but the original Trolls and the soundtrack to that, uh, that is, I, I will recommend that movie to anybody with or without children. I, I would actually agree. I, oh, trust me, I know it very well with with my my, my little ones. I, we we listened literally the troll soundtrack is is on repeat in the car in the boat. It doesn't matter when I'm around the kids. Like at night, well, they just they love it. So that's how we ended up deciding to go on that. But yeah, that's. that's Are you cool. going face paint or do you have an actual costume? I have a costume. It sort of sort of like rides up a little bit too much. So I gotta like. <laughs> 
I'm not so sure it's about a youth it. Large. Yeah, it might be a little small, but uh, we're gonna try to make it work. All right. Anything else you want to get in here? Man, I, I think I'm. Well, I, one other, one other thing that I wasn't sort of like going back on the on the on the tournament side of things. Yeah. I, I just sort of I'm passionate about for this side of things long term. This is just sort of organization side on, on both bass and mlf and i think that we have to look at is um you know i'm all about i understand like a mindset of like you know paying everybody in a field i get that i try to understand what we're trying to do i think what we need to try to really look at though i think is is the middle guy the middle class in tournament bass fishing is 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 getting the short end of the stick i mean i would love to see long term the opportunity where the middle guy makes a good, a good amount of money. What I'm saying by this. Okay. Explain. Uh, let me explain. So it MLF last year. Okay. The payout. I'm just going to look off that payout. Cause that's the one I know. Uh, 40th place gets 10 grand. 11th gets 10 grand. We mm-hmm. have to make it to where the guys that get 20th are making 12,000, 13,000. They're getting rewarded for the, for performing at a higher level. There needs to be a staggered payout just like in golf is it's like, it needs to be, I just feel like there's an opportunity there. Cause I, and then, and then of course paying the whole field, um, that just basically takes care of the guys who aren't necessarily performing. It needs to be where the guys in the middle of the field are, are, are making, making solid money. And that's not looking at it. Like from my standpoint, for me, benefit of, for me at all, I'm, I'm looking at it is like, I think anglers, we need to really get it to where, um, now there's only so much money in the sport and, and, and there's only so much money that bass is putting into their payout in the anger. That's a big thing is, is lead contribution is what is what we're all looking at. Like you're looking, okay, well, bass is putting in, I think bass put in 4.2 million into their payout. And I want to say MLF this year, uh, put in 4.4 million into their payout. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like, I just, I, I truth, I understand like the pay to play aspect of things, but I think that it just, we've obviously tried to go with no entry fee. We've tried all these. It's not big things. enough. Ever. That's it's been one of my pet peeves is people saying, well, in order to be a real sport, you can't pay to play. Well, in order to do this and be a real sport, you have to have a fan base and revenue that generates enough interest and income based on sponsor dollars for these anglers to not have to pay to play, but it's not there yet. And they tried it and it proved that it's not there yet. So until it quote unquote grows big enough to where you're as Jeffries would say, go into are much bigger. And then some of that goes out as could go into the payout that would reduce the entry fee is just the sport. The professional tournament bass fishing sport is not big enough to sustain a no pay to play model right now. 100 percent i got i think that the one thing that does irritate me a little bit there's some things that mlf has done like giving that opportunity to anglers with no entry fees that they don't get credit for they don't get the credit for like trying to be something different trying to look out like that's two years of almost two years where anglers had no risk involved with they also had to get them to go over there though so there i mean that's a pretty big carrot to throw out but they did, but in that scenario, also when you really look at what okay, this is other thing is which is interesting to me. This is just sort of another. Everybody talks about how crazy that the payouts were back in two thousand seven, two thousand four, two thousand six. You know, or you know, in the two, early two thousand. Mm-hmm. Let's just say that, and they were. There's a lot of money in the sport, you know. So everybody can look back at the best time in tournament bass fishing where the money was was. But listen, fishing FLW tour. Um, in 15, 16, that time frame, did it was not, you know, the first place was a hundred thousand dollars and it dropped off super quick. The lead contribution was just not there. Um, same thing at Bass. I remember qualifying, uh, making two top tens in, in 2018, and I got, I think, sixth and seventh. I had thirteen thousand dollars for for seventh place and maybe like mm-hmm. or sixth place or thirteen five. And it was like a hundred thousand for first, twenty five thousand for second, and and twenty thousand for third, and, and and so on. So we've definitely overall we're in a better position than what we were. But it, we we there's room to grow for the for the anglers. We're trying to push on the on these leagues to give more angler con, more league contribution to give anglers more. And, and and so I just think that sometimes we look at things a little bit, and it's like. You can always find a worse spot that we've been in in the sport as well. I mean, of course, mm-hmm. it's easy to go back to 
to the to the the heyday of, of of the 2000s for sure yeah i would also a lot of people have forgotten that they're in like 07 and 08 bass had the majors which were no uh entry fee i think they had i don't know, they had three majors i know one was like the brian kirchhoff memorial when i think was a ray scott and they were quarter million dollar first place no entry fee uh televised tournaments for the top percentage of the elite series field similar uh to what the BPT did the first couple of years with the cups where after every of every two events, the top percentage would make that cup, which was a no entry fee cup that had a payout. So, I mean, both organizations have made an, an effort a to cut back when they had to and give them the bare minimum, but then also to give back, uh, to give back when they have the ability to, I don't think there is a right answer to this. I think you'll have guys who hate MLF will always hate MLF regardless of what it is. Uh, you'll yeah. also have guys who, uh, who don't like the bass model who never have, and they'll never be happy going back to that. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see where it goes in the next six months to three years though. Uh, because if there's one thing we know, I mean, the elite series has been around for 16 years, but if you go back and you look at every single model before that, with the exception of the FLW tour, which actually changed its format a lot during the years and the Bassmaster elite series, everything changes every three to five years, the number of anglers in it, the format, how it's scored, what the payout is. Uh, so we're just taking these elite series since 2006 and saying, well, everything stays the same since race got started. This thing, it's been a constant evolution. Yeah, it definitely has. I mean, and I, and I think that one thing that we all sort of, I mean, one thing we all sort of, I, I, I look at it is long term, we all have to figure out one way where, or some way to where we're fishing under one one organization. There's an NFL of of, of, of professional bass fishing. You brought to. it up. When does that happen? Give me a time period. Three years, five years, 10 years. Mm, I say five to 10. I say five to 10. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of animosity towards each other right now. There's a lot of negativity floating around. There's a lot of things happening, but I think that I think that if if everybody could separate and they could say like, look, really, what we need for this sport is to have one organization. Now, listen, when MLF originally started, their whole mindset was to own bass. You know, there's some things that mm -hmm. um, their motives. I don't feel like. They were I wish built. MLF had just come out and said they're a competitive organization. We're trying to freaking own them. We're trying to be better. Than I one hundred percent agree with that. I will that we that. want to see Bass go under because then we get everything. I would that, if they had just I said it's a versus Bass it. versus MLF instead of the passive aggressive. Well, we love everything. Yes, like don't play the because because the fact is the mindset of owning the space is what needs to happen. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that either organization is in the leadership and either organization is the perfect scenario for that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that is what has to happen to elevate the sport of Bastion. There needs to be one Toyota series slash open series. There needs to be the BFLs. There needs to be everything that's run through one organization. And that has to happen. It just does. Mm -hmm. um, so they were right in that. I do agree with you. I think that they would have been a lot better off. Like, look, we're trying to own the host space. And, and I think that that would have, maybe been a little bit better, like you said, than just sort of like playing it all for sure. All right. Just, that's interesting. You leave, anyway. leave, leave, that's intriguing five years. So then I, I would I assume five to 10. Five to 10. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful for that because I, again, like I want to see something like there's a couple things we have to figure out. We have to figure out a, a way to make professional bashing more entertaining on the forward facing sonar side of things. And they're doing, I know both leagues are trying to figure yeah. this out. I know there's there's the product has to be entertaining, and I think that to a conventional fan, um, an everyday fan of of just watching sporting events, of course the, the every fish counts format that's kind of more entertaining to them. Not saying, but it has to still be relevant and important to those anglers that that are competing on a five fish level format. And if the minimums are high enough, if the minimums are high enough, and they're close to the that seven or eight fish weighed in or ten fish weighed in at that cut line, then it, then the techniques really don't change that much. Um, and it, it's the same thing. So it's like, there's some scenarios of just, it, just making it a sort of a happy medium, but I, I don't know what the perfect, I don't know what bass fishing holds. I don't know what, what's going to happen. I don't, I just, I mean, I, it, it's, um, it's crazy times. I know that, uh, you know, I, there's just a lot of things we could long-term that, you know, there's a lot of, we can go a lot of different ways with this, but overall, mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's some things that definitely need to change and things that, that, um, 
we can do to help help this whole thing out. Uh, last question: over under over under fifty percent chance. Greater than fifty percent chance, less than fifty percent chance that at some point in your career you fish for the Bassmaster Classic title again. Say it one more time. Oh, f- greater than a fifty percent chance that it, let's we'll say the next ten years, or wait, wait, less wait. than a fifty percent chance that you're that you fish in the Bassmaster for Bassmaster Classic title in the next decade. Well, so if 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 I, what I'm saying, if what I'm saying it comes true, then that'd be a yes. Years, then that would be yes. If because if, there's if, no way that goes away because that's that's no, the eternity. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That has the history behind the history behind it. Um, yeah, so I would say yes. Okay, that's so, intriguing. I I don't. This is the problem with the whole. You don't know. Is like there's not anglers are not gonna. Ain't bat. You pay forty five thousand dollars in entry fees at bass. Mm-hmm. Okay, you pay forty five thousand dollars. You know, proposed paid entry fees at MLF. Your payout or lead contribution aspect to everything. An angler's n- not going to leave MLF to go pay 45 to go for a year of the opens that doesn't pay worth a darn, even, <laughs> even yeah. with yeah, now you guys can sure go whatever you want, but in the, the day, those opens are not where it's at as far it's as rough. it's not. And, and and you can sit here and say, well, these changes are made and come on. Like, let's no, you're not fishing for a hundred thousand. You're not getting the, the marketing. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to the guys that are like, man, it's just, it's, it's not pleasant when you're used to being the apex. So, so then you're going to go and jump in the opens, try to make your qualify the elites. And then you're in the exact same position you were at MLF at that point in time yeah. with the same lead contribution and the same money you're investing in the deal. Why would you do that? So the realistically only, I mean, that's it. I mean, some the classic is the realistic that. only answer to that would be. Yeah. And, and it could exactly. So like you take a, um, or you take consistency. Okay. Or mm-hmm. they like a five fish tournament. So there's some things, but it's just, it's tough in that scenario. Like they're at this point in time, it's apples to oranges as far as lead contribution and payout other than, other than the classic that, you know, on your side, you know, as far as yeah. money earned, as far as a business side of things goes, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty much, I'm just, I'm just, I'm no, I know. you know, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me. Like I just, I look at this and I'm trying to understand. I'm like, Huh. I, and there's always is this this mindset of grass is greener on the other side. There's there's got anglers that would love, you know, to not left bass. There's anglers that are happy where they're at or mm-hmm. have been happy where they're at at MLF. There's ang- you know, there's a lot of different things, but it's a um it's just like it, I don't I I don't know how to solve any of the problems until it's just one league. Yeah. I mean, you put yourself in a position to be asked those questions, though, with your fishing. Did you ever think you'd be talking about this when you won the All-American? Was that 2010, 2011, 2009? What year did you win the All-American in? That seems uh, like forever. 11. 11. Yeah, 2011. No, yeah, and that's sort of what is sort of surreal. I, I um, It's crazy thinking about that. Like, I mean, it is a little bit different, like where I was at when I was 20 years old in 2011. And to think that we're talking about having these conversations where I'm at in the sport is um, it's nuts. I mean, it is. It's it's, it's, somebody asked me this the other day is like, do you ever do you ever like reflect on like your past and what goes on? I said, like to me, like I always try to look like there's going to be a point in time when I'm going downhill in my career. I'm not going to make the best decisions. There's going to be somebody behind me whooping me that would be competing way at a higher level than mm-hmm. I ever thought about. And so like the only way to look at it is continue to like climb that mountain and keep going up the mountain until, and then as the time, to- the time when you have to go back down the mountain is the time to reflect on what, what sort of happened throughout your career. But until then it's sort of, of a difficult time. So yeah. no, I would have never thought in 2011 that I would be sitting here in this position Overall, obviously, I had no idea what bass fishing was. The, the ins and outs of bass fishing, like I know today, and how things are run, um, you know. But yeah, it's it's a little bit, it's a little nuts. All right, dude, I'm gonna let you bounce. I greatly appreciate it, man. That was uh, that was a very insightful, uh, insightful interview, and I appreciate the time. Absolutely, man. It's always fun talking with you, big dog. You All right, see, you, see you, Jacob. See you. All right, that is uh, the one and only. Jacob Wheeler. We'll take a break and uh, unpack today's show and what we have to look forward to uh, when we have Baggins BTL on a Monday. We'll be back right after this. 
Elite Series Pro Daryl Gleason here. My Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries, it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different. And really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic, that gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.xzonelures.com and check them out for yourself. The great thing about the new Sensation Soft Plastics from Big Bite Baits, heavily scented, super soft, buoyant, comes in seven great new shapes. I've got a couple of them of my signature series, the Cliffhanger Worm and the Ramtail Craw. Great for a flipping jig, football jig, swim jig, all that. Several other great shapes. Really excited about it. We've worked over the last year. Catches fish all over the country, and I think it's going to catch fish for people everywhere you try it. The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat so you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors including Pearl Shad which has this bleached out white look but it's got this pearlescent really really pretty. We've got Copper Shad which looks amazing in the water. It's got that purple flake on the back really really pops in the water. And then if you want some real pop, we've got Sparkle Shad, nothing but sparkles all over this thing. And then last but not least, we've got the Matte Sexy Shad, just a really different looking color for a crankbait. So you wanna give them a little different look, that Matte Sexy Shad is definitely the one to go with. All these colors are available in the original Little John and the MD. Having confidence in your tackle while on the water is one of the main things to success in my opinion. In the last couple of years with Denali, I've had just that. From anything from spinning rods, casting rods, tungsten products, even now to casting and spinning reels, I have the confidence to go out there and get the job done and know that all my equipment is going to handle it and do it just the way I want it. The thing about Denali is you've got great quality products at a great price point, so make sure you check them out. Have you considered purchasing new electronics for your rig? The type of mounts you choose to protect your investment should be part of the decision-making process. No matter if you prefer one, two, or three graphs up front, Beatdown Outdoors has a solution for you. Adjustable, versatile, rigid, and made in the USA. What's your ultimate electronic setup? Check out the full selection of Beatdown Outdoors products by visiting beatdownoutdoors.com. I'm the kind of guy that never leaves a house without a pocket knife, and Gamagatsu's come out with the EDC series of knives. EDC stands for everyday carry, so whether you're on the water or off, you can always have it with you. The best thing about it to me is that assisted open feature. With this D2 blade, you've got it right here at your fingertips, so if you can't find your scissors, you need to cut a knot, you need to cut your braid, you've always got it. Make sure you check it out. Never leave home without your Gamagatsu EDC knife. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament bass fishing, from household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. All right, welcome back. Wrapping things up here on a very busy Monday in professional bass fishing. Uh, I kind of go back and forth on how much to do shows that just strictly revolve around the business. I know we typically do day four that's a uh, that has a lot of uh, fishing content, but based on the three E's that uh, BTL has always been entertain, educate, and engage, I know there's some people that probably don't find the backside, the business side of this to be uh, entertaining. Uh, there's there's some people that are on here probably and understandably because I am too on how Mike McClellan throws a wiggle wart this time of the year, uh, big spinner baits in the fall. I want to make sure that I don't lose track that hey 
definitely get some fishing in here, but also uh, the show does cover professional bass fishing. And this is the biggest thing going in professional bass fishing. So uh, do I, am I thrilled and look forward to the, the kind of uh, back end business shows? It doesn't get me going as much as uh, like when we had Casey Ashley on who did a deep dive into a shaky head. In all honesty, I would rather talk about that for 40 minutes. But I also think to have uh, an educational show, uh, I've always said we have, the most uh, educated audience BTL that follow uh, the professional bass fishing scene. Uh, greatly appreciate the feedback. M most of the feedback, there's some interesting feedback, but most of the feedback uh, and the engagement to kind of figure out what's going on uh, across the board on a yearly basis. And it's really been pretty crazy. If you think about it, since this was announced uh, at the end of uh, at the end of, well, this since it was announced in 18 and then at the end of 2019 with the purchase of, uh, of FLW. So, uh, that's all we got for today's show working on the rest of the week shows. We will be back Thursday with uncle Frank. I do want to remind everybody, uh, if you get a chance, head over to the bass tank, uh, or just click on the link. I'll put the link in the uh, YouTube description after winter is a great time. If you want to do some of your own install stuff, if you have questions about that, uh, Scott Palmer from the Bass Tank, his new venture, the Bass Tank Academy, uh, is a really, it's a subscription based for a month, but we were talking all sorts of how to videos. So you can sit in your garage, you can watch that stuff. Uh, and you know how, how good Scott is when it comes to, uh, installs and kind of really going deep into the weeds. Uh, also if you are doing any fall fishing, head over to omniafishing.com, use the code BTL. Uh, 23 to get 15% off your first purchase and also code BTL for pro guide batteries. If you guys are looking to, uh, to change batteries, maybe get into, uh, some lithiums or just, uh, get a fresh set of AGMs in there. Uh, that'll get you 10% off over at pro guide batteries. I do also, before we leave, want to mention the pumpkin carving contest. I mentioned it before with uncle Frank, uh, tag at Matt Pangrak or, and Frank Scalish. Uh, or if you don't have Instagram, you can email me a picture of your pumpkin with your, uh, with your contact info. And then on, uh, Thursday, Frank will judge those pumpkins. So, and then the winner gets a set of, uh, two, two places, a complete set of, uh, DD 22s and a set of fat boys that uncle Frank has. So big shout out to Jacob Wheeler. He came on. He did not have to come on and do that. Listen, he jumped on this thing a minute and a half before we went live. He had absolutely no clue what I was going to ask him. He literally had enough time to get on, say the connection looks good. I said, any direction? He goes, nope, whatever you want to do. He goes, have at it. Mad props to him. Uh, I think we also take for granted that that uh, that I do sometimes. I mean, that you have access to the top guys in the world uh, that are willing to come on, that are willing to put themselves on the line, be vulnerable and talk about it. So big shout out to Jacob Wheeler and for all the listeners, we will be back with a brand new BTL tomorrow, Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. Until then, we'll see everybody later. Bye.